Hello and welcome to Curious City. My name is Letty and I'm one of the co-founders of Curious Arts. This is a podcast all about encouraging people to get curious about what's going on creatively across the city. Um, I will be talking to a collection of individuals and organisations and companies that are making an impact and it's all about trying to encourage you to get off the sofa and get out into the world. Let's have a listen to who we're talking to today. Hello and welcome to Curious City. I am with the lovely James Stone who is a Sheffield-based scriptwriter, director and stonemason. Yes, hi. Hello James, thanks for coming. You're very welcome, pleased to be here. Good. Um, (laughs) Now, are there any, which one of those three categories do you feel is most James Stone? I have to say these days the scriptwriter, director is probably um, taking more of my time up. Um, Stonemasonry can be a young man's game. A young person's game, I should say. It's quite good, um, though, that you're called James Stone and you're a stonemason. Yes, I'm afraid it has nothing to do. I don't have a long line of ancestors oh, who are stonemasons. Would have been useful, but uh, no, it was just something. Actually, I came to stonemasonry later in life, in my 30s. I, How? Um, How does one stumble upon stonemasonry? Well, I'd been in theatre as an actor and then sort of later as a, a sort of writer, director, uh, writer for advertising. And I had one of those kind of midlife, oh, my goodness, what am I doing with my life? Uh, nothing I ever create lasts longer than five minutes yes. and I want to do something more practical, more uh, something that lasts a long time. That you can actually see the fruits of your labour yes. forever. Yes, and also where you work often on your own, with just you and a piece of stone, uh, and that's quite sort of therapeutic. I, I quite say. like the idea. So I, uh, I, just, I retrained for three years and, and, and sort of did it as an apprentice uh, for a couple of years as well. Um, but the difficulty is you have to be able to do a lot of lifting, you have to be yeah, very fit to, be to very do it, physical. and you have to sometimes be outside when it's very, very cold. Mm, I and would not like that aspect. Ones. No. So, what's, and also, what's the piece uh, that you're most proud of? What sort um, of stuff do you make? Well, I worked, uh, I, I did what's called banker masonry, and banker masonry is carving architectural pieces for buildings from a drawing. So if you work in a cathedral, for instance, or something like that, work on a listed building, you get uh, a a selection of drawings and you have to turn a block of stone into a capital or a a spiral or a volute or something like that. So that's what I trained in uh, so I can work on listed buildings. And so I did a a year's apprenticeship with Hardwick Hall, which is just south of Sheffield. lovely. And I think, yes, the piece I'm most proud of is probably a, a volute, which went into the roof of Hardwick Hall. If you know Hardwick Hall, they have what's called strap work on the roof of the towers, which is lots of decorative stone. They have um, ES, the initials of Elizabeth Shrewsbury, and they have crowns. And a volute is like a spiral. You see, I thought it was something you did with peas. A volute. That's a, is that... Oh, it's a volute. <laughs> a volute, so right. So you haven't just covered Hardwick Hall in peas? No, no, no. I haven't, no. Right, yeah, I mean, good. it might be connected, I don't know, but... but uh, <laughs> So I took down a, a volute which was carved by a mason 400 years ago, it was worn out, and recreated it in to new f- stone. Sort of from new, a new piece of yeah, stone? Yeah, from a new block of stone from their quarry, oh. and um, carved it in the shape of a volute and put it back, put it, put it in the building. That was quite a big moment sort I of when it, it went was. in. Um, and I suppose it's that nice kind of, you feel like you are... A, a part of a part of history like yeah you, you've you've taken you've sort of it's joined the hands of history exactly in fact when you take out the old one you see all the markings inside the stone of, of the mason 400 years ago and you realize you're actually doing the same markings as this chap and it would have been a chap in those days yeah. uh, who put it in and so you do feel yes you are reaching back 400 years or so and also that you know, in another 400 years, maybe someone else will be someone in a in some kind of spacecraft will come in. Yeah, <laughs> some kind of hoverboard. Yeah, doing will be it replacing it. Yes, yeah. um, and it lasts a long time, so that that's nice. Whereas a that lot too. of the work we do with writing and directing has kind of a seasonal value, and and then often that's it's it. Gone into the ether. Yes. So how did you 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 started life as an actor? Is that right? Um, yes. After university, I the, I got bitten by the bug, mm, I suppose. It happens. Uh, and it happens. Yes, and did a lot of acting at university, and then afterwards I uh, did acting for about five years. I would say managed to get paid work for about five years, and then realised that really I probably wasn't very good. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Were you enjoying good. it? Though? I was enjoying it, but um, yeah, it's it's not a very stable life, as most actors would know. Yes, uh, you have I, to be I really second that. Yes, as you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you have to be very focused uh, and be able to cope with a lot of rejection. Oh, it's so and, hard. And I kind of thought, um, I'm not, I think maybe I got bitten by the bug and then 
recovered. <laughs> Mum was an actress and then she turned into an agent and mm. was an agent for over 20 years. And she used to have people coming in to talk to her and say, you know, well, I sort of think I might want to be an actor. Mm. And she would always say, no, that that is not good enough. Thinking you not. you yeah. have to, you know, she'd say, is there something else that you could do? Mm. Is there something else that would make you happy? And if they were like, yeah. Mm. She'd say, well, God's sake, go and do that. Yeah. But if you have to do it, I think that's that's the only way that actors, mm. the actors that make it are those kind of actors, I think. I think you're absolutely right, yeah. Um, you have to just really want it and yes. need it almost. Yes. So I went into writing and directing after that because I've managed to find work doing that. Right. And, um, and found that sits much better with me, actually. Um, and so that's where I am now. So... Mm. You, you say that one of your most, well, one of your proudest moments, quite rightly, was when you finished your first full-length play. Oh, yes, yeah. So tell us a bit about that. What was it? Um, well, my first full-length play I finished, uh, must be about three years ago now. It's called Paradise Road, and it has been produced in Sheffield uh, a couple of years ago at the Library Theatre. And, um, yeah, I think, I think the reason I felt so proud about it is because it is a massive thing to do, a full-length play. Yeah. Um, and... Um, to, to actually get to the end of it, to rewrite it, rewrite it, and do lots of drafts of How it. How did you know when it was finished? Um, I sort of kept doing more and more drafts, and it's as you read the whole thing from beginning to end, it sort of takes a shape, right? and it has a consistency to it. Um, there aren't any anomalies in it. It all feels of a, of a whole, and it feels the style is consistent. You can pick up the pace of it. You, you understand the pace of it, mm. and it just feels... Ready. You know, ready. Having said that, it was then produced, and then there was feedback from that, uh, and also from theatres that I sent it to. Uh, there's a bit of feedback there, so I have rewritten it <laughs> and gone back again. And but is it going to have a, a revival? I hope so, yes. Um, I, I literally finished re writing it um, just before Christmas, uh, and um, so I'm about to start sending it out to readers and to theatres again, Great. and hopefully it will have uh, another, another go. What's it about? Um, Paradise Road is about a London couple who open their home to refugees from Iraq. And these are Armenian Iraqis. And uh, they come and live with them. And as the two couples get to know each other, uh, it soon becomes clear that um, all is not what it seems. Ooh. And uh, nobody is quite who they seem to be. So it's a bit of a thriller. Oh, wow. Um, but in it also is the issue of what would it be like to open your home and let um, a couple of people who are asylum seekers come and live in your house with you. I mean, it's a really important question, isn't it? Yes. Would I mean, you do it? Uh, well, you see, this is why I started writing it, because uh, about six years ago, when the Syrian refugee crisis was at its height, um, there was a lot of um, stuff in the news about the government's not doing a very good job of uh, accepting refugees, so we should all open our homes, and you know, if you've got a spare room you should invite refugees to come and live with you. And I remember thinking, hmm. Would I actually do what that? What would that be like? Yeah. And um, at the same time, I was also, I won't go into too much detail, but I was also, um, I also heard a lecture about uh, the Austrian architect Hunterdweiser, who developed a uh, theory behind his architecture about five skins. And each of us have five skins, uh, the skin of your body, right. the clothes you wear, um, the house you live in, uh, your social position, and also the ecology, the environment that you live in. Gosh, how interesting. Well, I, this is tied in with the whole refugee thing. Because right. if someone comes and lives in your house, in this country, this idea that the English person's house is their castle, mm. uh, because we build our homes to be this secure environment, it means what goes on in there is actually very intimate. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so if you have someone coming living with you, they are seeing and experiencing parts of your life that really you and your family mainly share and of course that can lead to all sorts of embarrassments troubles awkwardness conflict yeah. uh, and so I was quite interested I was quite interested in why I was so reluctant to open my house to refugees and imagine that people in other cultures might be more welcoming actually yeah uh, I do think it's a it is a huge part of the English culture isn't it that sort of privacy yes privacy and 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 sort of yeah building your home to be exactly what you and your family want and that's it really yeah um, so i worked with uh, assist sheffield which is the charity that works with refugees in, in sheffield destitute asylum seekers in sheffield uh, and we sort of did a, a, a partnership together when we produced the the first uh, show of paradise road uh, and do you uh, does your work generally in general require a lot of research yes 
Um, I, I like to write plays that I think have a chance of changing people's minds about something. I tend to want to do it quite subtly and yeah. usually dressed up as something else. So Paradise Road was a bit of a thriller. Uh, and my next play hopefully will be a bit of a comedy, but with a very serious message inside of it. Are but you working on that at the moment? Yeah, so I'm about to start fleshing it out. I've got some basic ideas, uh, and I can't really talk about it just yet because they all, they all sound okay. very vague. But, um, but research is very important increasingly because um, if you write characters that aren't in your own... Um, immediate environment so if I write about someone who's from Iraq or uh, you know an Armenian Iraqi um, you have to be very careful course, um, that you've, yeah. you've done you've some research re represent them properly yeah to make sure that that you're not misrepresenting them in any major way I think you still have to use your imagination mm -hmm. and I think there is a still a fairly safe assumption that people around the world are generally all interested in eating having shelter, having love, and having hope, uh, and those things we all have in common. Yeah. So I don't think it's impossible to write characters from other cultures, but yes, you do have to know that you're not making an absolute fool of yourself by making an <laughs> assumption that's, that's, that's not true. So yeah, yeah. that's very important. But it, it, similarly, it's important to make sure that all your characters are, are, are well-researched and well-rounded. Well yeah. Um, so you, I happen to know that you are working on a very interesting project at the moment hmm. that I suppose it's not diverse it's it's not theatre but you write and direct for different mediums um well I do now um I was mainly working theatre and then this opportunity came up this uh, virtual reality film project um and it, it just came out of the blue uh, there's an organization in South Yorkshire called Epic and they work with um <coughs> they work with vulnerable uh, children and teenagers in South Yorkshire who are particularly vulnerable to organised crime. Um, okay. So gangs, drug organisations, uh, county lines and that kind of thing. Uh, and they had the idea, why not use virtual reality to try and reach out to these vulnerable children uh, and give them some kind of film experience, uh, an immersive experience to warn them and to make them more resilient against organised crime. I mean, it's such a good idea. I mean, how do they, fi how do they find these children, though, to, to show them? Oh, well, they, these are normally in, uh, they're either in, in schools okay. or perhaps they're excluded from schools, so they're an alternative education okay. provision. Um, there are youth clubs as well, uh, fewer than there used to be, but um, Epic have youth workers working for them. Uh, and they, they, they do outreach. I actually was embedded with a youth worker for one night uh, in uh, Maltby, and that was a very interesting experience. Really? I was, uh, my admiration for youth workers has, has gone absolutely sky high now because... Uh, I think we've got this sort of rather nostalgic view of, of what a youth club is, and it's sort <laughs> yes. of quite twee, and yes. uh, someone gets out some ham sandwiches and everyone plays snooker, but it, I can imagine it's not quite like it's that. It's different now, and I think also there's a problem that because youth workers, uh, youth clubs have now gone into decline, there's, there's less resources going into youth work all the time. Um, there are less youth workers, and there's less uh, academic research into good youth work and that kind of thing. Yeah. This is what I hear anyway. So we really are in a bit of a, a, a stick here, and... and, and in South Yorkshire, there are certain areas of South Yorkshire that are very fertile grounds for organised crime groups to, to, to go in because there are a lot of young people who are living uh, difficult lives. And, and they trap them in a, in a very yes, interesting they do. way, don't they? Well, eventually they do. They, they start by spending money on them a lot of the time. Mm. Um, so you have a lot of uh, young people in these areas who are quite literally hungry a lot of the time. It's just awful, isn't it? Yes. Um, also, for instance, one of the, one of the features of the, uh, today is, is if you're on free school meals, what do you do in the summer holidays? And, the, yeah. you know, and, and you literally do have children who are hungry on a daily basis, but particularly uh, when school's not in. Because uh, that's the one meal they, they know they're going to get a day, isn't well, it? Well, exactly, yes. Um, and so a lot of these organised crime groups will start their outreach by buying food mm. uh, for young people in chicken shops or kebab shops or whatever. And that begins the relationship. They will particularly focus in on children that they feel are vulnerable, um, children who will be loyal to them, yeah. and children that they can gain the trust of. Uh, so they will gain the trust, they will test them, giving them small tasks to do, and then eventually they will trap them. Uh, and this is usually by creating a debt trap, uh, by giving them a package to look after, right. and then by actually mugging them and having the package stolen. Uh, they don't know it's the same people. Uh, and then saying, well, that package, you know, it's got three grand worth of stuff in it, so you owe us three grand, and that's it. The trap is uh, is sprung, and uh, they've 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 got them. Then they can so uh, they just use them on county lines or just just running on the streets and selling drugs. Um, 
So that was the idea. The idea was to try and help young people join the dots and, and, and see that this, this is what happens to you and that there's no way you can win, in actual fact. No. More often than not, you either end your time in organised crime in jail or, or dead because um, the level of violence is extremely high in some areas. Uh, and are these kind of, are we talking about homegrown gangs? Uh, yes, most of them are just, yeah, homegrown gangs in, in the particular areas uh, where where this sort of thing exists. I mean, people may move into particular areas and start supplying. Yeah. Um, I wasn't particularly concerned with the supply side, although I'm getting more interested in that now. For me, it was very much on the streets. What is the experience of these vulnerable young people? How do they know if they're being kind of groomed for it, I suppose? Yes, and also do they know what will happen in a gang? Because the gangs offer them so much. They offer them money. They often offer them sort of free possessions. Shelter, yeah. uh, they offer them community. They offer them a family, which often is something that they don't have at home, mm. or not as, as we might like to think of it. Uh, and so they, they, it's difficult for the local society and the local economy to compete with yeah. the gangs, because what is on offer in a, in a town where there's quite a lot of deprivation? Um, so for a lot of young people, it's a no-brainer. If someone says to you, can you look after this package for 300 quid, they're going to say, yeah. Um, but they don't realise perhaps what they're getting themselves into, and a couple of months down the line, they can find themselves on a train to some small town somewhere on a, with a county line burner phone uh, and they're trapped. It's absolutely uh, terrifying. And how old, like, how old are these children? What kind of ages are we talking? Well, the children we were aiming at was, were, were between sort of 10 and 16. Yeah. Uh, they can be younger uh, and it sort of does go right up into the sort of 18 or 20s. But this was the age range that we were really focusing on. And it was really just to create a fictional uh, immersive video experience. So when these when these children put the headsets on, they are a character called Charlie. Yeah. And uh, Charlie then gets uh, goes through an experience where uh, he or she is approached by someone and maybe that's a gang member, maybe it isn't. Uh, and then they go through different scenes uh, where they're given choices sometimes, okay. uh, but ultimately it takes them through the whole experience from being approached in a park to ending up in a trap house somewhere uh, with, with just no way out. Um, so that'll be launching in May. And that's uh, at Cast in Don Doncaster? The launch is at Cast in Doncaster, and then it'll be rolled out into schools uh, and uh, other organisations uh, throughout the rest of the year. It sounds amazing. It's been an ab absolute eye-opener for me. Yeah. Um, also, filming in VR is something I've never experienced before. Uh, uh, how does it differ? It differs from normal film, I suppose, uh, in as much as you have one camera in one fixed position... Uh, this is for like a 180 degree film. Okay. You can do 360. So if you imagine it's like a camera on a pole God. and it's filming everywhere, all around you and up and ab above you and below you. Because then one of the problems you've got is where do you put your crew? Yes, <laughs> and absolutely. So, well, here your crew have to sort of hide they behind have to all things. Wear invisibility cloaks. <laughs> That's right. Well, well, we we filled it in 180, 180 degrees. So we've got somewhere for us to to hide. Yeah. Um, so you've got one camera, one fixed position, and very long takes because mm. you can't really do cut-ins uh, you can't do different shots from different angles um, so in that respect it's very much like theatre um, because in theatre you're worried about blocking yeah. um, which is when actors stand in front of each other and get in the way of each other which in normal film you don't have to worry about because no, no. you can just reposition the camera and get a close-up um, so it, I, I was using a lot of the same techniques as I would use when I'm directing a, a play to make sure that the the experience was was uh, was good for the for, for VR um, but you can do there's there's all sorts of things you can do you can do with effects and that, that kind of thing can be put in which you can't do with theatre yeah um, and also like it's kind of going back to what you were saying about that the uh, fascination with with stonemasonry was that you could actually see something, something mm -hmm. tangible from your work. And it, I guess it's the same with this, because it you, is. you have created something that isn't going to disappear off into the ether after the last curtain call. Hopefully, yes. And I mean, there is a, it is a pilot project. It's, um, it's between um, Epic and Doncaster uh, Children's Services Trust, who have put forward this, um, this proposal, uh, which was then funded by Nesta. And the film has been produced by Peel Interactive, which is a, a Yorkshire-based uh, entertainment and uh, media company. Um, and so as it's a pilot, the idea is to try and roll it out in other areas as well and build on that success. And there is interest from uh, other areas of Britain as well. And uh, I understand people are coming from London to see the, the launch and uh, maybe people from the Home Office even, which would be great. That would be amazing. It'd be good for them to see what... Uh, can can your average Joe come and come to the launch? Yeah, is it an invite only? I think it might be invite only because of limited, limited space, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah.
Oh, well, I hope, I hope I get to see it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, like a lot of creatives, um, you reference self-doubt as being one of the hardest elements of, of your work and what yes. you do. So mm. how do you overcome it? Um, that's a very tricky one. Um, I think in many ways you don't ever really overcome it. What you manage to do is convince yourself in a sort of cycle that maybe you can do it. Um, so often I, I find I will write something or direct something and it goes very well. Then the panic sets in when you think, that's it now, there's nothing else in me. I've I'm, done it. I've done it, I'm never going to work again. Uh, so there is often a little period of down after that, but then you, you start to sort of pick up again. Um, and I suppose the fact that you do keep getting people interested in your work uh, is a good sign. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons I left acting because people weren't that interested <laughs> in me as an actor. <laughs> and I was beginning to realise that maybe that, that was, was a bit, of a, bit of a sign, yeah. Um, but I, I reckon, I mean, do, do you think that your experience at that time that you spent acting has had an impact on the way that you approach writing and directing? Oh, I think so, definitely. I mean, as an actor, Working as an actor, you, you, you very quickly get to understand what it is that actors want and how actors work. So you know how an actor pr prepares and creates a character. Uh, and you know w what's troubling for an actor and the mm. vulnerabilities of an actor. Um, so s certainly in terms of directing, I think it, that kind of having been an actor and worked with other actors is a priceless experience because it's much, much easier to communicate and yeah. to nurture and to encourage actors to be their best if you know what they're what experiencing. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, Did you ever work with any directors that had a particular impact, either positive or negative, on, on you? Um, yes. I would, I've, I've worked with directors who were very uh, liberating, who'd give, give you, a, a, if you like, a long... Um, what's the word? Um, they'd give you enough rope to... Not to hang yourself, but a, a lot of freedom yeah, to really to express yourself. I mean, a lot of that depends on the length of rehearsals and all that sort of thing. But directors who who want you to find the character in, in yourself and give you the time to do that tended to be more successful. I think um, the ones that I worked with who were less uh, successful were perhaps those who come to a, uh, the beginning of rehearsal period with a... Blocking uh, in place. An idea set in stone yeah. uh, that they're going to, you know, it's got to be like this, and if you don't get there, they're not going to be happy. Um, but as a director myself, you do keep learning. Uh, yeah. And you do still make mistakes and you do look back and Thanks. have oh, memories that make God. you turn over in bed at night and yeah. you think, no, did I really do that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, you just, you just can, can keep learning. I think, the, yeah, to be a good director, I, I feel, and, and when I've had most success, it's when you work well with the cast. It's not necessary that you've had a stunning idea. Uh, it's not necessary that you're doing something incredibly original that's out there. Often it's just that you've managed to liberate your actors and, and get them working to the, the best. best they can be. Yeah, best they can be. Um, you describe your life as an ongoing struggle to take care of your family, <laughs> write an amazing play and get fit. Right, this is the problem with questionnaires I that you used to in before. <laughs> I know, <laughs> terrible. But I'm, yes. I'm only going to draw on that one. Okay. Write an amazing play. Yes. In your opinion, what constitutes an amazing play? I think an amazing play stands the test of time and does have an effect on an audience. If, if an audience is still talking about your play uh, for months and years ahead, uh, then I think you've, you've had a success. Um, I'll give you an example, actually. I mean, I used to think, you know, you, people would say, well, theatre can't really change anything. You know, you go to the theatre, you see a musical, it's not really going to change your life. Um, but I remember when I was young, my mum, uh, who was what you might term a housewife, in mm -hmm. the 70s and 80s, suddenly decided she wanted to go and do a course at the university. And um, I only just really made the, the, the connection there that this was shortly after she and my father had been to see Educating Rita. I was going to say it was Educating Rita. <laughs> yes. And I, didn't, I remember when I first saw Educating Rita, I think I was a teenage boy, I thought, oh, it's a bit dull, it's not a very good play, you know. Um, but since, I've come to realise that there is a perfect example of a popular piece of yeah, popular play which was then turned into a very very popular film obviously yes, yeah. um, which had a message in it which did change people's lives it's very important it's not just a light comedy yeah. I think it and was and I bet your mum was, wasn't the only one no I'm sure she wasn't no and of course my dad seeing it as well yeah. would probably make a difference as well uh, yeah so I think I think that that's amazing if it, if it sort of changes people's lives I mean you can make plays that shock people 
you can make groundbreaking plays with you know an absolutely a new way of doing things. I'm thinking about um, Sky's Edge, which was p- was put on at the Sheffield Theatres yes. last year. I think that was a kind of genre breaking new musical. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's there's lots of different sort of forms of amazing plays. I mean, it's <laughs> difficult to say what is an amazing play. Um, but I think the best you can come away with is something that people talk about, keep talking about, and it sort, it of, sort of stays with you. Yeah, it shakes people up a little bit, maybe gets them talking, yeah. uh, and helps us all realise that um, we're not alone. Oh. We're all going through this together. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yes. Um, where do you? Where, where does your creativity come from? Is it? Ooh. Are you? Are you from a family of creatives or? Um, not particularly, no. Um, I suppose it comes from clowning around at school to begin with. Um, <laughs> I come from quite a large family, I suppose, okay. uh, and I was always the entertaining one. Maybe That's it was your, attention your seeking. Role. Yes, when I was younger, maybe it was just me getting attention by being funny Probably or James. doing voices, yes, <laughs> <laughs> or making up stories. Um, but I was always, and also being quite observant, I think, helps yeah. uh, you to be creative if you mull and think and cogitate, and if you're always thinking and having space to think as a as a as a as a boy and a, as a teenager, you know, and, and thinking a lot. Um, you that, start yeah, to I do that. I, I do think that there is this uh, common kind of mis- misconception or misperception, rather, of actors just being a kind of bunch of rowdy show-offs. But <laughs> I, in my experience, some of the, the best actors are, are the quiet ones I that listen and that observe. I would agree with you. I think a lot of the best actors I've worked with and some of the best that there are out there are actually quite introverted people. Yes. And that's why they're often they're quite disappointing in interviews, um, because actually they, they don't particularly want to to Talk get to l- meet lots of people. No. Um, yeah, people always make, make that mistake. They kind of say, "Oh, you're an actor. Uh, you, you'll find this easy. You love parties, and you oh love God, no. you know uh, the worst one is they love doing a best man speech at a wedding. That'll be easy for you, won't it? No, but public speaking is my absolute worst because well, no one's giving you the lines. It, you're you. It's you. It's you. And that's what actors do not want to no. be. That People don't go into acting to be themselves. No, they go uh, to just ha- run away from themselves, really. Yeah. And a best man's speech is the closest you'll ever come to being a stand-up comedian and being a stand-up comedian <sighs> is not the same no. as being an actor. Have you ever done a best man speech? Um, I've done two, yes. How did and they go? They were very frightening. Uh, they went okay. Uh, I, I hesitate to... <laughs> To quote from uh, Four Weddings and Funeral, that, that neither of the couples are together anymore. <laughs> That's actually true. Oh, God. But uh, I hope they're not the listening. The kiss of death from James Yes, Stone. I'm afraid so. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of actors want to go on stage, you know, with that barrier between them and the audience, be watched, be applauded, and then just quietly go home at the end of yeah. the night or at least have a drink with their mates and that's it. That's it. Um, Job done. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just want to talk, f- finally, uh, a little bit uh, about your relationship to Sheffield mm. and you know you've obviously got a lot of love for the city yes um how how does how do you think living and growing up in Sheffield has impacted your work oh that's an interesting one um yes I don't people don't believe I'm from Sheffield because of the way I speak um but I was born here uh, my Hunter's mum Bar, I believe. Hunter's Bar yes well I was, yeah, yeah lived in Hunter's Bar or just in Nether Edge um my mum was born and schooled, well, in Sheffield. And, um, yeah, I went to Hunter's Bar School, went to High Store School. Um, I think Sheffield, when I was young, uh, it, which is in the 80s, I'm afraid to say, um, was great in terms of creativity. There was a lot going on in schools. In my school, we did, you know, a Gilbert and Sullivan musical every year. God. And they did plays like, you know, Bertolt Brecht and things like that. Um, and there was a lot of artistic investments. There were orchestras all over the city, um, and I think it was a great time and really encouraged a lot of cre- creativity. Uh, Sheffield was also that kind of socialist republic of South Yorkshire thing was going on, so there was a certain very strong identity in Sheffield, yeah. an identity of defiance. Um, you know, the Human League were all yes. We're, all, we're going when I was we're, we're very popular. I still see them around. <laughs> Bless them. They all still live here. Good. Um, so they should. Yes. Uh, and so yeah, there was there was very much yeah. But at the same time, I think Sheffield is is actually quite a humble place. Mm. It's it's not as um, I hesitate to say up itself, but it's it's not as uh, yeah. It hasn't got that kind of Manchester thing going on or the Leeds thing. Uh, I was I mean I lived in Leeds for a long time and I think Leeds and Manchester have that. That are up themselves. Well, no, I'm not going to say, I'm going to be very careful here. <laughs> I sometimes feel that they're competing 
to be the London of the North or yes. to be the sort of capital of the North. Um, Sheffield's never really had any pretensions to do that. But what Sheffield is, is it's very distinctive. It's, it's unique. It's, um, yes. People from Sheffield Quietly know it. self-assured, isn't yes. it? Yes. Mm. And it's beautiful. It's actually a beautiful city. Yeah. And, and people from Sheffield know this, and people who come to Sheffield soon realise it. And a lot of them stay. And it's well, a, and We've got such a... Um, uh, a high percentage of people that like come to universe university here it's that great. retention rate yes yeah uh, which is great uh i think it's it is the north's best kept secret almost people don't quite realize just how great sheffield is yeah. um but i i also hope sometimes i think that lack of ambition that you might sort of identify with with that humility can be a problem uh i i remember speaking to someone from sheffield a long time ago who said the problem with sheffield is they have no aspiration um, whether that's because we had, you know, we had a, a really hard time in the 80s and, and basically were, you know, decimated by, by the 80s and the steel industry almost disappeared, um, I don't know. But I hope, and I think it is, Sheffield is moving. Sheffield's on the up. Oh, Sheffield uh, is undoubtedly on the up. And I think creativity, crea- creatively it is as well. Yeah. The opportunities are increasing all the time and uh, Curious Arts is, is part of that. Thank uh, you, James. And, you know, Sheffield Theatres is doing exciting things. You've got Dina, you've got Delhi, uh, Delhi Theatre Delhi. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot going on. And, um, and there's lots of performing arts people. I mean, High Stores, my school, is still very strong in performing arts and... Uh, so yeah, it's exciting. It's an exciting time. Mm. Well, I am going to leave us on that lovely, lovely, uplifting note. <laughs> Great. James Stone, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. A Curious Arts production. <laughs>